Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Richard Stevenson and I am the director of Stevenson Dental Solutions in San Dimas, California. And today we're going to discuss the amalgam preparation on a natural tooth. This is going to be the first of a multiple tooth series where we're going to prepare this quadrant with direct restorations and then eventually convert it over to indirect restorations. It's going to be a lot of fun. So I've taken some teeth and mounted them in a typodon and I've created some artificial caries. We're going to start with the 330 burr and drop that to 1.5 millimeters. I like to do this near the box area because I'm not going to overextend into a marginal ridge in that particular area. It's really important to keep the burr perpendicular to the occlusal surface at all times. We're now going to extend into the mesial side to create the dovetail. Try to keep the dovetail parallel to the proximal surface on the mesial. Now we're going to extend out towards the proximal contact on the distal. It's good to try to aim towards the contact and not try to create the box at this time. Now we're going to switch over to the 245 burr because we're going to want to have a longer burr to reach down to the gingival aspect of the proximal box. Now this burr is only 0.8 millimeters wide so you can keep the burr away from the adjacent tooth and not worry about going too deep axially. The other thing you want to do is you want to try to focus just on the box and not on the caries. Don't let the caries distract you from the geometric configuration that you're trying to create. We're going to deal with caries in the fifth step of GV Black's steps of cavity preparation, not in the first step. So continue shaping the box, go a little deeper axially so that you can get the adequate depth into dentin. Breaking facial contact is oftentimes really challenging on maxillary premolars because you're usually in an area where you're transitioning between the proximal surface and the facial surface. In a situation like this, it's a good idea to try to undermine some enamel and then chip it away with a hatchet if you can. I'm going to attempt to do it here. Unfortunately, the enamel is just too hard. So, we're back to the burr. So we undermine some enamel, we go at it again with the enamel hatchet, and we achieve success. After we've got the contact broken on the facial, you can utilize a gingival margin trimmer, this is a distal GMT, to remove any loose enamel rods of the gingival, and even on the facial and lingual as well. Whatever hand instrument you use, make sure that it's really sharp. I'm going back to the hatchet here to try to get more extension. It's not working really well, so ultimately we're going to go back and get that with the burr and try again with the hatchet. I think at this point, let's switch over to the 330 RGS to do some smoothing of the S-curve, open up that outline a little bit so we'll have better access to the caries removal process. The 330 RGS is ideal for generation of the S-curve and for maintaining the convergency of the occlusal walls and creating a flat pulpal wall. Remember to diverge that mesial dovetail wall. This burr just works fantastic. I love it. This was the burr that I worked with for over a year with Brasser to develop this burr so that students can make better looking class 2 preparations, particularly for board exams. That little bump on the lingual needs to be rounded off and this kind of leads to a little bit of an overextension on the lingual, but that's common on maxillary premolars and not usually an issue. Let's remove some caries with a four round burr in slow speed. The key with caries removal is to get the DEJ and the enamel as clean as possible. We don't like to leave any stains. 
for demineralizations in the enamel or dentin, particularly near the DEJ. In this particular case, the caries was not so deep pulpally or axially, so we decided to remove almost all of it. Remember, that caries I'm removing right there was generated by me artificially. If you want to find out how I did that, and you're a dental educator, I'll let you in on the secret if you send me a comment. As an optional step, you could put a liner. Most board exams don't require this, but I thought we'd just try it out, see how it looks. This is a glass ionomer. I like to vibrate it onto the tooth so that it transfers from the instrument to the defect area. This is a 40 second cure. So once it's cured, you can go back with a slow speed in the 330 RGS and remove any excess liner that is on walls where it shouldn't be, like those vertical walls of the occlusal. This worked out pretty well, particularly if you're using slow speed. I'm using the friction grip attachment on my slow speed, but you could also use electric ampies. Turn it down to about 5,000 RPMs. We can verify that we have proper extensions by using the RGS-1 instrument. This measures 1.5 millimeters length, so you can check depth and also extensions. This is the RGS-3, which is one millimeter wide. And we can also use the RGS-4 to check out the depth of the axial, which is slightly less than 1.5. That's pretty ideal. Like I was saying earlier, this preparation is pretty tricky because the exit angle is occurring right between the facial and the proximal surface. So the S-curve is quite wide as it leaves the isthmus area. But that's the way the prep has to look on this particular tooth. So let's look one more time at the extensions with the RGS instruments. This is the RGS-1 little more than 0.4 there, about 0.4 on the facial. 1.5 millimeters deep with that dovetail leaning towards the mesial. The width of the isthmus is one millimeter. The depth of the axial or the gingival width is less than 1.5, about 1.4. So it looks like we had a pretty good result today and this is part one of many to come. Thanks for watching.